years ago while we were still in Kentucky, I did a, a, a sermon series one fall. And the title of the series was Fine-Tuning Your Family, Bringing Christ's Clarity into Your Home. And at the time that that was going on, one of the things that I, I thought was taking place, and obviously we can look back and say, yeah, that happened, was that there seemed to be this cultural attack on what was traditionally held as a biblical family. And in the ten years that have passed, not much has changed. Although what I think has happened has been now that the traditional family kind of is not at the center of the conflict, what seems to be taking place now is that traditional biblical Christianity like ours seems to be under the same cultural oppression that the families experienced for, uh, before. And so I've been trying to figure out how do we as a church respond to that and what do we as individuals do in light of that and how how do we fine-tune our faith so that we as the people of God have the clarity of Christ as we function in the world around us. Today, I just kind of want to start the series and, and introduce you to the text so that, that God can begin to work on your heart and your mind as you start going over this passage in preparation for the weeks to come. I'm in Joshua chapter 23, and as you go ahead and turn there, let me go ahead and kind of lay out the context for what's taking place. As we begin, we find ourselves at the end of the life of Joshua. Joshua has been, been God's appointed leader over all of Israel, if you'll recall. He was Moses' right-hand man. And following the death of Moses, Joshua began to be the leader of the people of Israel. While Moses was the man through whom God led Israel out of the Egyptian slavery, Joshua becomes the man through whom God leads His people into the Promised Land. Joshua has seen Israel at her best. He's seen Israel at her worst. He knows what potential lies with Israel if she'll only be faithful to the Lord their God. And Joshua knows also with clarity what can happen to Israel if they choose to turn away from the Lord their God. He's grown old leading them and at the point of, uh, of our text today, he's 110 years old. He's still at work. 110 years old and he's still leading the people of God. For those of you who think your time to quit is getting closer and closer, nah, you don't get to quit until God calls you home. He knows that his time to die is getting very close. And like the great leader that he is, he tries one last time to, to instruct his people. He calls for, for an assembly of Israel and all the officials and all the leaders and all the elders and all the judges and all the teachers are gathered before Joshua. And he begins to pour out his heart like a father would to a child. He's worked so hard on their behalf his, his entire life. He's learned so much about them and about their God in the process. Joshua wants the best for Israel, the very best, and so he sets out to give them some final words of instruction. Beginning in chapter 23, a long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from their surrounding enemies and Joshua was old and well advanced in years, Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders and its heads and judges and officers, and he said to them, I am now old and well advanced in years, and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all of these nations for your sake. For it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. 
Behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes those nations that remain along with all of the nations that I have already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. Then the Lord your God will push them back before you. He will drive them out of your side and you shall possess their land just as the Lord your God promised you. Therefore, be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law, turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor to the left, that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you or make mention of the names of their gods or swear by them or serve them or bow down to them. But you shall cling to the Lord your God just as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations. And as for you, no man has been able to stand before you to this day. One man of you puts to flight a thousand, since it is the Lord your God who fights for you, just as He promised He would. Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. Joshua is concerned about the future of Israel. He's a little apprehensive about leaving them, but he's dying, so he really has no voice in the matter. He's done the best that he can, and in verses 6 through 11, he makes one final attempt to direct his people towards the Father. He spells out very clearly three safeguards for Israel's continued faithfulness to the Lord. Those three safeguards. He says, if you're going to stay faithful, courageously uphold the Word of the Lord. If you're going to stay faithful, completely be separated from the peoples around them. If they're going to stay faithful, they must stay connected to their God through an abounding and abiding love. Now, I said Joshua was Moses' right-hand man. He was the helper. He was, was the assistant. He was Moses' confidant. He was his friend. Israel is now fairly well settled in the promised land. Joshua has been involved in, in their leadership every step of the way. And the point I'm, I'm making is this. Joshua has more experience with the children of Israel than any other living person on the planet. He knows how they behave. He knows where they're prone to fall and to fail. He, more than any other, knows what they need if they're going to continue to experience the hand of God guiding and guarding and protecting them. What he has to say isn't just last-minute advice that, that comes off the cuff. He, he, he has carefully weighed his words. He's thought them out and he's bathed them in hours and hours of prayer. Joshua, in this passage, as he points out the potential pitfalls that Israel could face, he also says, in our past, every time we've struggled, every time we've fallen, every time we've gotten into trouble, every time that we felt the hand of God be removed from us or, or be held harshly against us, every time we've been delivered into the hands of our enemies, it's been because of one of these three things. It's been because we've turned away from the Word of the Lord. It's because we've, we've, we've traded in our God for the pagan idols in the the surrounding communities. It's because we've chosen not to love or to be loved by God. And if we'll pay attention to our weaknesses, he says, if we'll work on these things that hold us back, he says, if we'll repair these areas of our lives that cut us off from experiencing the fullness of God's presence, then we will know and enjoy our special privilege as God's chosen people. But if we don't, if we don't, just as every good thing the Lord has promised us has come true, every bad thing the Lord has promised will come true as well. It's an exciting time as you look back at it. Terrifying probably in the moment, but, but it's make it or break it day for the children of Israel. At least that's the way it seems to me. 
It's, it's, it's now or never. If we're going to move forward, today is the day that we determine the steps that we're going to take. And as I draw back from that and I look around today, I think for us as a church, maybe it's safe to say that we're about at the point of make it or break it time. It's now or never if we're going to move forward as the people of God. I mean, we've got all these struggles and we just kind of muddle through them and, 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 and we're at the place where we can't muddle anymore. It's time of transition for the people of God here. And so I believe in this story of Joshua and the children of Israel, there's some very relevant applications for us today. These three safeguards for Israel apply just as much to us as they did to them. When we find ourselves in trouble, when we find ourselves deep in struggle, when we find that maybe the hand of God isn't resting so favorably on us anymore, every time that our enemies prosper and we seem to go reverse, when we find ourselves in a spiritual mess and our lives, our homes, our churches begin teetering, the brink of maybe falling apart, self-destructing. It's because I think we've done the same things Israel did in her past. People change, but yet they don't. Times change and yet things stay the same. I believe for us, when our lives aren't experiencing the presence of the Lord like they should, I think it's because of these same three things. It's because we've turned away from the Word of the Lord our God. We go our own way. We do our own thing. We rely on our own wisdom and our own understanding. We replace God's outdated, old-fashioned Word with something that's a little more modern and a little more applicable. Sound familiar? Sound like the world around us? Sound like home? God does not honor people who do not honor His Word. When our lives aren't experiencing the presence of the Lord like we think we should, maybe it's because we've traded in our our devotion to God for our devotion to the little gods of this world. I've made the statement, and in the last two days we've got to the point where the St. Louis Cardinals have lost eight of the last ten games. We've been beat by the Pirates. We've been beat by the darn Cubs. We've been beat by the worst team in baseball. And all of the people that I run around with outside of this church, that is the only thing we have talked about for the last week. Well, oh... A lot of us inside the church, we've talked about that a lot too. All the while, how many refugees are being dumped out or chased down or or, or killed around the world? How many believers in Christ have been persecuted for their faith? How many people in our neighborhoods are living hopeless, meaningless lives because they have no relationship with the King of kings and the Lord of lords? But... Oh, we got to get the Cardinals back. I mean, do you see how that fits? I mean, the Cardinals are like, they score way... And I, I love the Cardinals. Don't, don't think you're winning me over to the other team. <laughs> Liz. I love the Cardinals, but... But I can't love them more than my Lord and my God. And so many of us do. And football season starting. And and, and my best friend is an Alabama football fan. And and they they don't get any worse than that. Alabama's pretty neat and it's a beautiful state for the most part. But I hate everything about Alabama because of their football fans. (laughs) Ask them about basketball and it helps them get clarity. But... But anything 
that we elevate on any higher plane than we do our devotion for the Lord God Almighty is idolatry and we're guilty of it and we can't figure out why we struggle in our lives when we're too busy worshiping a whole bunch of other garbage rather than the God who has made us and created us and used us in the past. Man, I'm telling you, this better speak. Because if we can't hear this, we're not going to hear anything. Our hobbies, our kids, uh, uh, the, the ideas that we formed and fashioned for ourselves, that we hold in higher esteem than we hold God, there's a problem with America and American Christians in large. We're devoted to sports. We're devoted to our free time. We're devoted to feeling pleasure. We're devoted to being made happy. And we could care less most of the time about God. I said it. It's out there. You can call me crazy and talk bad about me at lunch, but I believe it. We're never going to experience the fullness of the Lord as we were intended to. We're never going to have, have a faith that is clear As long as we keep teetering with all the other little gods this world wants to set up in front of us, we've got to make up our mind. And then the third point. If we want to know the fullness of the presence of the Lord, and we're not, maybe it's because we've chosen not to love or to be loved by the One who loves us most. You know, for many of us in our lives of faith, we often leave love so much out of the picture. We leave the grace of God so much out of the picture. And it's, i got to do this, and I've got to do that, and I have to perform, and I have to get it right. And, 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 and we do so much out of obligation rather than out of love for and love of God. And I think when we start leaving love out of the picture, our hearts quickly get detached. And when our hearts get detached, they begin to wander. And we worry, why why am I not experiencing God? And yet we fail to notice our hearts have led us astray. Well, that's not all that takes place in the passage At the end of Joshua's life, he senses the Lord leading him to to guide the children of Israel through this formal rededication process, a a re-giving of themselves to God yet again. Joshua gathers the people of Israel a second time. At the first gathering in chapter 23, he pours out his heart. The second gathering in chapter 24, he pours out God's heart as he addresses them. Moving on, And Joshua said to all of the people, This is what the Lord says, the God of Israel. Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob. And Esau, and I gave Esau the hill country. And Jacob and his children, they went down to Egypt. And I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst of it. And afterward, I brought you out. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen. And when they cried to the Lord, He put darkness between you and the Egyptians. And He made the sea come upon them and cover them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. And you lived in the wilderness a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you and I gave them into your hand and you took possession of their land. And I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel. And he sent and invited Balaam, the son of Baor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Indeed, he blessed you. So I delivered you out of his hand. And you went over the Jordan and you came to Jericho and the leaders of Jericho fought against you. And also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, everybody on the planet was against you. 
and I gave them into your hand. And I sent a hornet before you which drove them out, the two kings of the Amorites. It was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored and cities that you had not built, and you dwell in them, and you eat the fruit of the vineyards and of the olive orchards that you did not plant. Joshua formally reminds Israel of God's faithfulness to them, even during their times of unfaithfulness to God. God blessed them. And He's done a good job at it. And He's cared for them. And He's loved them. And He's protected and fought and provided and guided them. And God now says, in all of this history, you have a part to play in your future. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now dwell. But as for me and as for my house, we will serve God the Lord. And I find those words speaking volumes today to the church. We've got a choice to make. You and I are the recipients of these words from God through Joshua today. And they require a response. It's not just a ho-hum, yeah, that sounds great but they're words that require a response from us. We have to choose to live unto ourselves as the pagans do or to live unto God as dearly loved children. And so for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to spend time talking about the response that we're to make. But I think initially there is a response God calls His people to make today. Will you serve the Lord or not? You see, in James, we're going to study later on this fall, but he says, a double-minded man is unstable in all that he does. It's like the waves of the sea blown and tossed by the wind, and it comes and it goes and it serves no purpose. A double-minded church is no different. We've got to make the decision, are we going to follow and serve the Lord as He has called us to do? Are we going to continue to do what we want? We've got to choose. What do you choose? Because I think the choice goes deeper than, yeah, I'm going to follow God, stupid, no kidding. That's a dumb question. But to choose the Lord is to choose Him over all others. Weddings. I love that moment when we're standing and we're talking to a bride and a groom and, and we get to the point where, where, where the groom declares, I choose you over every other woman on the planet. And I will esteem you and hold you higher than any other on this earth. It's the greatest moment ever, isn't it? You lived it. And you're still alive to tell it. It's the the most wonderful moment ever. And I think that as a church, the the same thing applies. Where, where we as the body of Christ and the bride of Christ are to declare, Jesus, I choose You over everything else. If it cost me my home, if it cost me my life, if it cost me my popularity, if it cost me my stunning good looks, whatever, I choose You. And until we make that choice, We're double-minded and unstable.
And the church in America will continue to be blown about by the wind and the waves. There's more at stake than us. There's more at stake than Wayne County. There's more at stake than the Cumberland Church. There's more at stake than Illinois or the United States. Or There's so much at stake. But it starts with us making the choice. Who do you choose? Me and my house, we choose the Lord. What about you? God, today as we close... Many of us are here and we must confess we are double-minded. You already knew it, but we have to say it. We're pulled in so many different directions that we can't devote ourselves to you or anything because we give just a little bit here and a little bit there. Some of us, O oh God, confess that Your Word is no different than the TV guide that sits on the table and it never gets read. Some of us confess, God, that we have a house full of tiny little idols. Some of us have to confess, O oh God, that love is the farthest thing from our minds. Before we can ever declare that we choose You, we must first confess the sin that pulls us away and holds us back. Some of us, God, we're not sure where we're at in the middle of all of this. We pray that through a declaration of the sin today, that we would open ourselves for the willingness to hear with clarity Your voice as You speak to us. God, that You would bring conviction. That You would bring change. That You would bring clarity to our lives. God, there's so much at stake for Your church to miss it. Help us. Help us. We ask in Christ's name. Amen.